So thank you everybody for attending. This is our last uh, ultrasound rounds of the academic year, that is. Um, so we'll restart again back in September. So it'll be a hiatus of uh, monthly rounds. So um, I did this just to kind of uh, go over some of kind of what's been happening in the program, but also review some cases uh, and talk about some interesting uh, ideas. So recent key highlights of the year, some interesting cases, talk about some cool physiology. First of all, uh, this year we've had uh, Lazmi Levanovic, uh, who's our who's here, who's uh, been an excellent fellow and has uh, done a lot uh, in his in his comparatively short time. So he's here with us in the room as well, actually. So nice work, Laz. You're, you'll be done end of September, right? Yep. And uh, but you'll be off. I suppose I won't say where. Into the wilderness. Into the wilderness. Um, and of course, we had uh, Andrew Robinson and Leon Biker, who both uh, who both basically finished around uh, September, October, twenty twenty one. Both who have passed their kind of busy, act, but who both passed their NBE exam. So congratulations to them, which is awesome. Uh, it means that we have more people in the in the zone who have this uh, illustrious accreditation. Going as present Edmonton, we have six ICNs with NBE uh, CC customers in our certification. Um, much more than that, too, who have either cardiology training or other types of training. We have 12 attendees across the zone with TE skills that work in both general and cardiac ICUs. So I think that's a pretty uh, awesome surge of people who have been trained. And almost every set of has at least one, two positions. In fact, some, some sites have grown to even three to four positions with expertise in critical ultrasound. So I think that's a huge amount of uh, surge of support we've seen, which is important for what's going to be coming. Uh, we formed a new Edmonton uh, zone uh, ICU group to uh, talk about some of these issues because uh, I think they're can become more important as time goes on. We've had 20 residents come through critical ultrasound. We had CRUS West 2021, which is very successful, uh, fully participated, but at half, uh, half the amount of enrollees. So 20 people who participated this year, we're, at, we're gonna be at 40 and we're fully booked already with a wait list. We've had two Western Canada ultrasound rounds, which have been highly attended and attended by Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, Alberta, both sites and uh, in British Columbia, which has been great. We've had eight Alberta Sona rounds. There's been a lot of education with Heartwork Simulator, which has been phenomenal uh, for teaching and uh, big website expansion, including uh, learning management system. A lot of research that's really, I think, surged this year too. So thanks to Vince's kind of lead on this for the COVID shunt uh, additional trial and somatic review, both pending publication. And uh, again, uh, hats off to Graham for this work, uh, who's kind of led this who's also helped a great deal and done a great job with that. And we completed Echo AKI, uh, basically multi-organ sonography for volume overload. That's done, and I'm not sure on the publication date on that one. We started enrolling in a TE registry as well at this site in CVICU. So um, that's been a, a multi-center or international trial of TE use and resuscitation, ICU, and emergency department. And we've ongoing research in artificial intelligence, machine learning, both heart and lung ultrasound in collaboration uh, with uh, radiology. And finally, Iconic, which is a uh, transcranial Doppler and optical inertia diameter and ALF, which is ongoing enrollment. This is Graham here who won first place in Research Day Awards, which is fantastic for his work in COVID-19 study, which I'm look very much looking forward to seeing it published. And this is coming down the pipeline here. This is uh, what's being referred to as enterprise imaging for point of care ultrasound. So there is increasing interest across AHS to standardize acquisition and interpretation of point of care ultrasound. And so in the next two years, there is a very, 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 very good chance, I'd say 99% chance that point of care imaging will officially become part of Connect Care, which is by far going to be the biggest leap for all programs. Um, but I think we're, we're probably the best prepared out of all of them. Um, that being said, there's still lots of um, lots of things we got to work on. Okay, lung ultrasound review. Got a case here, 32 year old female, traumatic brain injury, recurrent aspiration pneumonia, intubated. She has a new right central venous catheter and served with chest X-ray, new worsening hypoxia and hypertension. A lung ultrasound performed rapidly. Um, I was going to use Mentimeter for this uh, presentation, but I had some major web glitches with the software. So I, I would love to kind of ask who here does lung ultrasound routinely for pneumothorax, but um, it's certainly a helpful technique. So in the room here, who, who does lung ultrasound for pneumothorax? So we got two. So, so, okay. 
And how about online? Who, who routinely does uh, ultrasound for pneumothorax? Anybody? Not hearing much, that's okay. So uh, here's the images. Someone wants to go ahead and describe what they're seeing here. So the, the image left you can see is on the right uh, anterior chest wall and it's just an M mode from the same area on the right. Madeline, you want to take a crack at it? So when I'm looking at the floral one, I don't see like the little comments. So yeah. I, I don't think um, the floral is moving. We have a predominant A line pattern. Um, so I see that. Um, I don't know if Um, that would be interesting with the pneumothorax at that point. Yeah. M mode, motion mode, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, there's there's these A lines here, right? So right here, you can see that these are reversion artifacts, equidistant. The A lines tell you whether or not it's pneumothorax. No, they don't, right? Yeah. Because the A-lines are generated from an uh, interface of, between tissue and air. So the A-lines actually don't really dictate the pneumothorax there. In fact, the, the pneumothoraxes that I've seen, the A-lines are actually more obvious. And again, probably because the difference in impedance is so much even higher than just plain alveoli. So we looked on the left side of her chest, obviously the different probe type, but what do we see here? Good lung sliding, right? So you can see the difference between these two, or at least uh, that clip is clearly not on a repeat, but you can tell the difference, right? In one case, we have uh, apposition of the visceral and parietal pleura, they're moving um, on the right, and then on the left, we see basically nothing, just some pro movement superficially. So this is a helpful skill. Now, of course, lack of sliding in itself does not say that it's pneumothorax. There is, there is a list of things that can um, have a lack of sliding. Um, but of course, you can look for one additional feature which tells you, which raises the specificity to be much higher. What, what would that finding be that increases the chance that this is indeed a pneumothorax? Any ideas? Lung point. Yeah. So looking at this image here, I'll admit this is actually not the best image to represent this finding. Um, but there is lack of sliding here. And there is actually a little bit of sliding there. But unfortunately, this, yeah, I don't think I picked the best clip to represent this finding. But uh, generally, what we're looking for is the interface between sliding and no sliding. OK, and if they're upright, if they're sitting upright, then of course, the air collects at the apex. And so the probe is oriented in the, in the sagittal or parasagittal plane. When they're laying supine, the air collects in the ventral air space. So your probe is oriented more so in the, uh, in the kind of the dorsal ventral plane or transverse plane, I guess is more accurate. So here's just an example of why this happens. Okay, this is that lung point. So obviously no sliding here and then sliding here. So if you look on this side, that's sliding. You look right here, you can see that the sliding there, this is a much clearer demonstration. Uh, oh. Of, uh, of that lung point. So sliding there next to no sliding. Okay, if you find that it's, uh, you know, specificity of pneumothorax is like 99%. Now there are things that mimic this. Okay, if you're at the lower portion of the thorax, the lung diaphragm point can also mimic this. Um, lung cardiac point as well, because the heart can interfere with pleural apposition and cause a similar artifact. But usually when that happens, you'll see a beating structure, i.e. the heart just below the pleura. Okay, so that's why that happens. Now, this is implications for the size of pneumothorax because, of course, that lung point uh, in a supine patient, of course, given that these are all supine CTs, um, you'll see that that lung point moves from medial to lateral, or I should say from, from ventral to dorsal. Okay, so it moves down, right? Because that, as a pneumothorax expands, so does the area of pleural apposition. Um, and this has been validated on a couple separate studies. Um, where they used uh, both CT and, and both uh, effectively a surgical uh, needle to mark the, the area of, of lung point on CT compared to ultrasound. So it does generally tend to give you a, a gross volumetric sense. So 
The important thing I take away from this, the kind of key principles is that if you have a very small area of no sliding on the interior chest wall in a supine patient, it's probably corresponds to a small pneumothorax. If your lung point is lateral, like say mid axillary, you're probably more of a moderate volume. And of course, posterior axillary um, is going to be correspond to moderate large. Um, now upright, of course, is different because the air, um, the air uh, collects in a different space. So this patient, okay, had the development of a large right pneumothorax. That pair has been under some mild tension, some mediastinal shift. You can see some tracheal shift there. Um, so indeed, there is pneumothorax here. Okay, so just in the apex there, it's, it can be hard to see on uh, you know, a presentation like this, but there is a, an, an area of error there and also there. So that's the, the problem, again, with patients who are supine, obviously, is that you can have these areas that aren't as obvious, okay, that go over the diaphragm, kind of a, coming on a deep sulcus sign. So chest tubes inserted, but there's still this big area here this uh, kind of persistent gas collection. So it doesn't quite drain it. Yeah, you come in, yeah. Um, so this large area, again, I'll just put that circle through so you guys can see. So this large area here of gas, still, there's still a decent sized pneumothorax there. Um, and that, you know, this can certainly happen with chest tubes, if, especially if uh, the lung kind of uh, collapses over the, the actual chest tube port sites, which is, I'm, I'm suspicious is what happened here. Um, obviously, the chance of developing a tension is much less likely, um, but none, needless to say, there's still large uh, pneumothorax here. So, new pigtail was inserted. You can see there, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, it's a bit twirly, not ideal because it can kink, but um, yeah, anterior approach. So, this is placed uh, about the second third intercostal space, uh, and ideally, you want this essentially lateral to navicular line to avoid any any inter any uh, mammary arteries. Those tend to bleed uh, quite dramatically. So uh, this is an anterior pigtail approach, which was guided with ultrasound. Okay, so basically in this patient, we found the area where there's lack of sliding uh, in that zone and placed it in that same area, knowing that there would not be a pleural apposition. And when I've, when I've done this in the past, I placed the tube and I've actually aspirated air with like a large 50 mil syringe and then attach, attach it to a chest tube to a plurivac. That way it's just evacuated. Um, so again, uh, we see, we see here that there's that airspace has uh, diminished uh, quite dramatically. So essentially resolved. So this, these pigtails with ultrasound, um, I'd say that, you know, the practice of these is quite variable. I know across Canada, um, I, I, on the East Coast, found to be pretty uncommon. Um, in Ontario, pretty spotty, but in Hamilton, they did this a ton. And this is where I learned this technique, uh, where, because we did them all the time in cardiac ICU, in the general systems ICU, this was the preferred approach because it's just air in a pneumothorax, right? Um, and plus, uh, it, it allows the benefit of having a chest tube and on an anterior chest wall, which is easy to care for, versus in the, you know, axilla, for example, or posterior axillary line. Plus, the patient comfort is very, very high compared to a conventional tube thoracostomy, for example. Uh, but in a supine patient, just be aware, as I demonstrated on that, uh, on those CTs, uh, images, for example, that the, the lung point is in the medial to lateral position. But generally, the principles would be the same for doing them anteriorly. Just make sure you stay lateral, make the particular line, uh, and find the area there's no sliding. And, you know, you can always go to the triangle of safety uh, as one area, if you're supine, uh, as one way to avoid any uh, injuries. But um, generally, it's a pretty safe technique. Who here has done this before? Have you ever one Not Oh, really? Okay. Um, well, honestly, uh, I've done them now. Like, I think I've done probably more on the on the hospital ward than I have in the ICU, uh, just because uh, it's easier and uh, it's it's pretty dramatic. Like, you put them in, they, the the air just disappears, and then you're done. But of course, and I have a sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a ahead. question for you. i um, we don't always stock our pigtails at the end. Like, what are you guys using? We usually, what I've used in the past is those blue Seldinger ones, which may be oh, yeah. what we need. No, those, those are not ideal. Yeah. 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 Can the we trocard. maybe look at um, standardizing that yep. like in the units across the region? Because I find, although 
you know, I can put them in. Like you say, it's trocar, and I, I find it's not as safe as it could be with some other. No, kind. no. So I use the Fearman train, but I'll. Um, can you send me an email, Jim, and we'll all sure. all research like that. So we use this Fearman drain. It's a non-string pigtail. Uh, the the kit comes with like your fire needle. It comes with a wire. It comes with a dilator. It comes with a uh, the pigtail, of course, and also a, a lure lock to a Christmas tree valve and a stopcock. And generally, you can actually just use like a Selinger approach. So use the needle attached to like a 10 mil syringe full of saline. And then, of course, you go above the rib. Once you aspirate air, you go a tiny bit further, a tiny bit further, just make sure the bevel's inside, and then introduce the wire and just go from there. It's very, very simple. The process takes, honestly, like less than three minutes. Uh, it's very, very fast. And the patient, toler it's tolerated very well. And those same uh, pigtails, Jim, we use for pleural effusions, paracentesis. They can also be used for pericardial drains too. So they're pretty versatile. You can adapt the, uh, the ribs to something. You can, but the blue ones, the blue ones, I, my concern about them is um, people end up uh, savaging a lot of kits together. Or, mm. And so I think it drives costs up. And then you have this trocard uh, pigtail, which the risk is someone actually uses it as yeah, it was built. Over and then stab someone in the liver and, and uh, you know. Yeah. yeah, radiology carries them. That's why we were using them. But um, I think it would be good to have something like what you're describing in our neuro unit. And even oh, yeah. I think it would be good to have them because we don't have those. Yeah, no, I definitely, I can, uh, I can uh, make, make something happen and figure something out because they're, they're so easy, uh, Jim. They're, they're just so versatile too. So it can be used for everything, so. Okay, so this Mr. Me, he's a 64-year-old male with five days shortness of breath, fever, chills, unvaccinated with a sore right elbow. He's sweaty, he's diaphoretic. Uh, I went down there as a consult and it was told to me that, you know, they thought he was presumed COVID. So of course he was being treated with what, what, if, what I would call kid gloves. Uh, um, he had a Ted, he had a, a red tender elbow, as I mentioned, white count 2031, which is a bit atypical for COVID. Um, they started him on dexamethasone and uh, basically gave him some empiric uh, community card antibiotics. Um, but we did feel, given the other white count, market pallor, diaphoresis, and sore elbow, that there may be a better unifying diagnosis. And so we did a lung ultrasound and we asked Ortho to tap this joint. So we just used the handheld machine. Uh, there's two of these now as part of GSICU. There's two in eMERGE here. I think the Alex now has one unit too. Isn't that right, Jim? Sorry, which one? Uh, this one here, it's the Philips Lumify. I think the Alex uh, recently mm. got one of these. Yeah, I think we have just one because I saw um, Andrea using one. Yeah, yeah, they're actually, the image quality is very good for cardiac and lung. It's honestly very, very good. So these are, these are really easy machines to use. They also now have pulse wave Doppler in them, which is kind of interesting. So, um, so I go, Put the probe on his chest and I find this as first in the first part. So this is R1. This corresponds to kind of the second third intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. Anybody want to take a stab at interpreting what exactly it is we're seeing here? Yeah. It's it's obviously not your lung sliding. Um you know, I don't think we're, I don't think I would, the pleura can't move like that because technically it's buttressed over the chest wall. So there's, there is, there is fluid in the pleural space. Mm -hmm. And as the patient's breathing, the lung is moving in that fashion. Yeah. So you would think it's almost like a consolidation, right? Yeah. Maybe some bronchograms there and, and this big, yeah. So, you know, this is why when we do lung exams, we do the full thorax because occasionally I uh, mean, you can find things that we don't pick up otherwise. Um, so exploring the interior chest, kind of just started moving around to see exactly what it was I was seeing here. Oh, there it is. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's more of this, uh, more of this lung and maybe there's some fibrinous strands or something in there or, you know, yeah. I mean, you'd wonder how much of this is actually heart, right? Cause some of this is heart you're seeing. I think when you, this is the, the right chest, but when you put a fluid column um, on the right chest and it allows you to actually see the heart when you wouldn't normally see it. So some of this is probably cardiac. It's just kind of hard to make out given the nature of uh, this image. More of this. Okay. 
Anything we're seeing here that's unusual? Any ideas so far? Yeah, okay, that's good. Is this, those are cavities, right? There's maybe some fluid built structures there that don't, would normally be there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that certainly was crossing my mind was I don't think this is COVID, right? Like something is not quite right here. So there's R2. So there's one area which, you know. Uh, well, uh, that's one possibility. I'll keep uh, going here, but wh what do you see here? Yeah, so lots of B lines, right? Those vertical artifacts that go from the plural line, the ring all the way down. It's not specific, yeah, certainly. Uh, it kind of depends on their distribution, for example, or unilateral, bilateral, focal, how many there are per site and other associated findings. Now I'm going to, what's that? Yeah. Now this is a uh, coronal plane of the right uh, R4 kind of posterior axillary line. Yeah. Kind of looks like, and where are those temptations? Are they below the diaphragm, above the diaphragm? Yeah, so probably above diaphragm, right? So, you know, I go exploring further. This is a transverse view of that right chest. Is this confirm or refute? It's a spider web. Yeah, it's a spider web, right? Like there's a, there's a net there looking to trap somebody. Um, so just, just to kind of illustrate what exactly we're seeing here, because this is a transverse view, which is commonly not taught and commonly misunderstood. But this is what we're looking at here. So you can see the liver on the inside, and this is a, like a, almost like a CT view, okay? That's the pleural space. So very much like you're seeing on this area here, okay? But we're, we're more towards the, uh, the liver and the diaphragm. So the transverse view kind of allows you to look at the, the pleural space differently, okay? Given that, um, you know, it's a, it is a three-dimensional space. So looking at it in just one plane, like in the coronal plane, for example, can be more uh, limiting. So often I turn the probe 90 degrees to get a better sense of uh, what we're dealing with from a volumetric standpoint and just from a, a characteristic standpoint. So there we go, there's some more pictures. So obviously here, there's a lot of loculations, right? Okay, the left side, you know, nothing dramatic. There was some ugly areas of maybe some subtotal consolidation and some B lines. Let's keep it. So, so obviously he looked pretty sick and we decided we, he, you know, probably should just go for a CT at this point in time. Um, and so we decided to intubate him for CT. So into the donut of truth, he went. <laughs> okay, so here's what we find. Okay, so on the top left image there, there's what appears to be a, a collection, okay, of fluid. It doesn't appear to be loculated, but certainly it is a collection of fluid. And then you can see in the top right there, there's a collection of fluid there just further, probably confluent. And there's also a, a pair of vertebral collection as well, posteriorly on top right. Okay, and, and then the bottom left, uh, sorry, the bottom image, we're just seeing more pleural fluid. So he had multiple collections uh, over his chest, as we kind of saw with lung ultrasound. So what the radiologist said was extensive pulmonary subpleural nodules, presumed inflammatory, infectious, uh, loculated bilateral pleural effusions, which are simple fluid density and do not demonstrate any significant peripheral enhancement to suggest empyema. So I think that that is the important part of that statement. Okay, because you know our technology is only as good as the person who's reading it and only as good as the technology itself. And so it but he must be lying, Brian, because there's a gas bubble in the fluid on the other side of the <laughs> diaphragm. So it's got to be infected. But he said, look, they said a single locule of gas. Yeah, it's infected. <laughs> Uncertain etiology. But anyways, I think, I, I, I suppose I want to highlight this, Mike. You, you definitely raised a good point. I mean, I just think that our pretest probability was extremely high. So it almost just didn't matter um, about whether or not would the, the fluid density appeared simple or complex. Um, it basically uh, was was until presumed otherwise. Yeah, so he grew um, staph aureus and blood cultures times two bottles in eight, within eight hours. And in fact, uh, we found out that he actually uh, did inject drugs. So that all kind of fit the bill. Um, a pigtail drain was inserted. 
um, and basically the staph virus grew out of the drain pretty quickly too. Now, TPA DNAs was trialed, but as you saw from the collections, obviously, I'm, I'm not sure if, if the TPA DNAs would actually reach the entire pleural space, and I'm skeptical that it, that it would. Um, but he actually just ended up requiring decortication. I don't think the TPA DNAs touched those other collections. You put multiple tubes into their pockets. Oh, I see. Think all of them didn't work that well. Even if you went surgical tube, it still didn't work. He needed to be cord. Yeah. Oh, so obviously, this is not, uh, you know, when he presented, there was lots of reasons for why it could be other things. But of course, this was, this was in the time of COVID, and so everything is COVID. Uh, the chest was largely incorrect, but maybe even misleading. The, the x-ray, uh, I don't know if I actually showed it, but the x-ray actually just showed kind of multiple uh, patchy opacities. It didn't show anything that was dramatic, certain suggestive of, uh, you know, a complex effusion. And the ultrasound is much more uh, predictive of a complex loculated effusion. So it's going to go back to different patterns. Um, so usually with transitive effusions, they're kind of, they're basically uh, anechogenic or anechoic, okay? They're mostly black with no septations or kind of fibrin stranding. There's no locules, um, but that's not always, okay? And I, I've certainly seen a patient, a couple patients here in this unit who've had effusions that uh, have appeared to be simple. Um, and certainly uh, they were most definitely empyemas. So I am very cautious with this. I generally say that, uh, that an exudative effusion can appear simple or complex, but generally a transudative effusion will appear mostly simple because a transudate, for a transudate to have locules would not really make sense. Like something is causing those, those or, or to have fibrin stranding, whether it's blood or, or pus, for example, um, are very common, whether infections or even uh, hemothoraces can, can kind of trap lung in and, and lead to some chronic uh, stranding. So, so yeah, um, this image here on the left actually is, uh, it's not terribly well seen. Um, it's of mixed density. This patient who actually was on river oxygen who would have fallen rib fractures and ended up with a large amount of clot in her chest. Um, and so uh, it, this was called consolidation, but um, she had deteriorated rapidly and dropped her hemoglobin and lo and behold, she had a basketball sized blood clot in her left chest. Well, when I saw it last, I, one thing I could tell, I don't, like, I don't know if this, this image doesn't really show well, is that I couldn't see any discernible parenchymal structures. Okay. And um, the, 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 like, there's no clear anatomical margins here. Yeah. And then when you, when you kind of could see it on the machine, you could tell that the internal components were, um, were very, very mixed, kind of very much not looking like, um, not looking like parenchyma. Did you witness or Oh no, uh, this patient was extremely sick and we just happened to, Ron Breezeball just happened to walk by and get wind of this and took her to the OR for a thoracotomy. Oh, yeah. awesome. And he evacuated a, like I said, a basketball sized blood clot. So there was, when I saw this, I thought there's no point in sticking a drain in because I don't think it's gonna do anything. It's a congealed mass. Yeah, I was gonna say, congealed. And I, and I actually kind of worried that she was having almost tamponade like features, yeah. like she was, it was tensioning a little bit. So, um, so, you know, I think that um, one thing I think most people who work in ICU um, realize is the chest X-ray is a useful tool, but of course it is just one tool. Um, and that ultrasound does offer a lot of benefit for our patients. Of course, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of interest uh, on lung ultrasound for COVID. So here is just a, an example of a patient who came in. See, the X-ray actually was, was fairly uh, bland. Um, Pretty textbook for a lot of COVID x-rays that we, I think, was, as we've all seen, the CT, of course, showed a little more patchy, um, a little more patchy infiltrates. And of course, lung ultrasound showed uh, much more. So some subpleural consolidations, some B lines, some, you know, relatively what appears to be kind of a thick, almost a thickened pleural line. Okay. And this is right here is fairly characteristic of COVID. So there's been a lot of people interested in this technology because of course, you can't CT every patient with COVID that comes to the door, although some places in the world do that, uh, especially looking for things like PEs, for example. But in most places, um, for example, in Italy, lung ultrasound was kind of the go-to because they just had so many at one point that they could not, uh, they could not uh, keep wrap on it. So of course, you know, a lot of interest uh, emerging from the lung ultrasound aficionados like Gino Soldati looking at lung ultrasound for COVID-19. Um, and you know they, they declared it to be kind of essential, safe. Uh, it's got high real potential. 
Um, so if your lung ultrasound is frankly banal or boring, then it's our not contributory. It's much less likely to be COVID. And there's been some uh, international kind of efforts to standardize how lung ultrasound is done. Although some of these protocols tend to be quite uh, comprehensive, like um, some of them are upwards of like 28 spot lung ultrasounds, which tends to get a bit uh, on the extreme side. This is a study, a uh, more recent one, uh, 2021, the Volcelli International Study in 20 sites uh, across US and, and Europe. Basically, patients who suspected uh, COVID-19 who also got a RT-PCR swab test, they, they basically identify three clinical phenotypes. One's mild, uh, without dyspnea or desaturation, just mild non-respiratory symptoms, no signs of respiratory failure. A severe phenotype, patients with dyspnea and desaturation. And then a mixed phenotype, if they had pre-existing cardiopulmonary comorbidities. And then they define the likelihood of COVID-19 pneumonia based off four different patterns, an intermediate, an alternative, and a low lung ultrasound probability. I'll just describe to you here, this is what they defined as our different criteria for these probabilities. So low probability was normal or near lung ultrasound pattern. So A lines, lung sliding, about significant B lines. High probability was typical lung ultrasound with bilateral multifocal clusters of separated or coalescent B lines large hyperchoic bands, especially across the plural line, they kind of dub as light beams. I'm not sure why that's exactly needed in the terminology, but that is what they call it. Multiple peripheral consolidation, the regular, regular plural line with or without large consolidations. So that's the high probability. The intermediate one is less typical pattern, um, unilateral isolated cluster B lines and light beams or focal multiple B lines with without small consolidations. And then alternative probability, um, for example, a large consolidation with dynamic care bronchograms, like a scene with pneumonia, for example, a large pleural effusion or diffuse homogeneously distributed B lines, which is more consistent with cardiogenic edema or perhaps underlying uh, diffuse fibrosis like an IPF or UIP problem. So here is kind of how they classified it overall. Again, these are all commerce, not just those with COVID. So there is 1,462. If when they combined the high lung ultrasound pattern between lung ultrasound pattern, the sensitivity was 90.2%. So fairly high sensitivity for ruling out. Um, and then patients with respiratory failure, of course, that's the pattern that we largely deal with. You can see the positive predictive value is around 96.5%. So of course, if you uh, have respiratory failure, you have dyspnea, you have desaturation, and you have a high lung ultrasound likelihood pattern, it's obviously very, very likely that you in fact have COVID. And this gold standard was, was the RT-PCR here. And then of course, um, if you combine the high lung ultrasound pattern and the intermediate pattern, you, you have very high sensitivity. So in terms of using, the, using this technology at the bedside for COVID, um, it tends to, to perform very well in patients with respiratory failure, perhaps less so if they have um, exi pre-existing comorbidities uh, or the, are, for example, very mild disease, uh, kind of non-respiratory symptoms. So certainly lung ultrasound is a helpful technique, albeit not everyone can do it. Um, there are lots of efforts to use machine learning to teach um, algorithms to interpret findings. For example, B lines, subplural consolidation, uh, and, and items like that. So you can see here, this is your typical pattern where you have you're aerated, you're sliding in your A lines, you get more B lines, you get a really nasty looking pleura and more B lines and eventually progresses to de-aerated consolidation. And then as you improve this, you know, theoretically goes slowly back. So that's the typical pattern of as patients progress. And usually when you start to see more of this consolidation um, in a patient with COVID who's you know, been on the ventilator, that's when your concern for fibrosis also goes up as well. So you know, we found that we were doing a lot of static compliance measurements in these patients because we, we worried that they were progressing to a fibrotic stage of, of COVID. So, and generally the kind of more severe they are tends to track pretty well the severity of lung ultrasound, unlike chest x-ray. Um, there have been actually efforts to use machine learning in chest x-rays for COVID and they have largely failed. Um, it tends to not work at all for COVID. So really it's lung ultrasound and or CT um, for this approach. And I hope in the future, we have probes we can just put on a patient's chest and it just basically spits out what, what, what the probe is finding. If you have more information on these findings, just go to Alberto Sono. Um, 
for you know things like subflow consolidations, B lines, uh, items like that. TE has been a pretty hot topic this year. Uh, with uh, I think there's been two grand rounds. I think Graham, you did one, and I did one. Um, and obviously, with COVID shunt, there's been a lot of interest. I think uh, both locally and frankly internationally on how we're using TE in the critical care setting. And uh, I think we've done a, a much better job at perhaps demystifying how T is performed, kind of its safety profile, its efficacy as a tool uh, for critical care patients. And I think the part that I'm most happy about is, you know, across Edmonton, we have, I think most sites now can readily perform uh, critical care TE, um, at least the, the bigger sites, um, you know, both the, the University Hospital and the Alex uh, can, can perform this with their own um, their machines on the unit. Pardon me? Yeah. Uh, Alex is up and running, I believe, yeah. And the nuns is up and running. Um, yeah. It's just, uh, I, I kind of refrain from saying all sites because obviously the sturgeon uh, has a machine that could be capable, but not a probe. And the misericordia, you know, is still sorting out uh, machine acquisition. So of course, lots of things you can do with, uh, with TE from or even the detection, obviously not, not the principal thing you're doing it for, but if you're in there and, you, and they go into VT, <laughs> you can actually <laughs> see the, the myocardium fibrillating, uh, which is pretty dramatic. They use it to optimize compression sites on the right, looking at uh, aortic valve opening, procedural guidance, uh, which can also be helpful, things like cardiac arrest from uh, you know severe bradycardia, for example, and detection of pathology. You can also use it for lung ultrasound uh, to look at the parenchyma, but also the pearl space for effusions. And a patient who is unable to go to the, the CT, who's very unstable, whether it's cardiorespiratory or hemodynamic, um, this can be a very helpful technique to, to do a heart, like a full heart lung exam at the bedside uh, and just kind of combine it all in one and, and get a really solid look at what you're dealing with. And I have had cases where I've used TE for both uh, to both uh, help give us perspective for therapeutic drainage of pleural effusions, but also for recruitment as well. Because occasionally you will find that um, with TE, you can, you can see more of those dorsal zones in a patient who's supine with ARDS, and that can help guide, for example, um, at least predict whether or not you think they'll respond to proning or perhaps uh, looking at some potential recruitment. And this was Andrew Robinson, won this illustrious competition at the uh, Care Society meeting uh, just, uh, I guess, later last year for this uh, case where we had a patient with a, who was called pneumonia, who was too, un too unstable for the CT, who ended up having bilateral massive effusions and intracardiac shunt. And so the patient was essentially in extremis and after inserting two chest tubes and changing the vent strategy was extubated in three days and, and uh, went to the ward. So I think we have some cases that, are, that have shown some pretty dramatic, uh, um, you know, therapeutic changes with, with TE, which is, I think has kind of driven its use. And with Echo AKI, there's certainly been a lot of interest uh, well, here and also on social media about kind of extracardic manifestations of venous congestion. Um, this is a more complicated topic. Um, I say this is more for the kind of ultrasound aficionados. Um, and from, from our you know, experience here at Echo AKI, this technique is not without its challenges. So here's just an example. One, one area we look is the hepatic vein. Um, so this is a pulse wave Doppler, that yellow line there through the hepatic vein. It's just looking at sampling of blood flow through that site. So the bottom waveform is a spectral waveform and that's looking at blood flow. The hepatic vein drains into the IVC. So it makes sense that your drainage pattern largely is just filling of the uh, IVC. Okay, and the, the bigger wave there you're seeing with every cycle is the S wave and the smaller wave is a D wave, okay? Now the, the, the thought, so first of all, severe trigastric regurg can flip the S wave. The S wave occurs in systole, obviously in, in trigastric regurgitation, you get a big systolic influx of blood into the right atrium, so it can flip the S wave. But in other cases, even without severe TR, uh, with severe venous congestion, okay, you can actually start to have that, that blood flow almost backflow. Okay, into the hepatic vein. Um, and that's kind of, that's been kind of one of the areas that kind of generate a lot of interest is, you know, if there's evidence of this happening, is this evidence of venous congestion in which maybe we should be looking at more diuresis than anything? So here's an example where in a normal case on the left, you have your S greater than D wave, 
then you see a mildly abnormal where the S wave shrinks, okay, and then a, and then a severe uh, reversal there, which the S wave flips in systole. Now, this is probably most commonly seen, this, this, this flip is most commonly seen in severe TR, because uh, again, because of that big bolus of blood in systole, but this can be seen in severe states of venous congestion. Now, we can also look at the portal vein. So on the left here, that's the portal vein, which is usually uh, a very kind of monophasic, uh, very static flow, which undulates a small, small bit, uh, but not much. We, we think uh, there is some evidence that in states of venous congestion that you have what's called an increased pulsatility fraction, that you, you begin to get a, a pulsatile portal vein, okay? But, um, you know, it's probably more complicated than that. There are studies showing that this can even happen in patients who have normal physiology, i.e. like healthy controls, will have an elevated pulsatility fraction. So I think there are some challenges to this technique. Not to mention, we don't really know how portal vein flow changes in the varying states of cirrhosis, for example, because obviously it does. Now, if you have, um, if you have, uh, you know, end stage cirrhosis, you will see this this whole uh, flow pattern change. It'll go below the baseline because the flow is effectively reversed. Okay, in severe states of cirrhosis, so that obviously is also limiting. But um, unfortunately, you know, that's. Although that's the severe case, there are, there are situations in between. On the right, this is looking at you know, venous congestion in the kidney. This right here is arterial flow. Below is venous flow. The venous flow should be continuous. And here you can see it's interrupted. You have S and D waves and you don't really have uh, flow. You don't have flow in between. So this again might suggest or appears to suggest at least in the heart failure literature that there is venous congestion because the blood flow is not continuous, okay? And what this does is it actually predicts renal failure. That's really what it does in the literature is it predicts that there is going to be or is kidney failure from this problem. It doesn't necessarily, we don't really know if this pattern changes if you have less venous congestion is some of the, is some of the part that's complicated about it. Um, but there is a lot of interest in it. The technique itself is actually very, very challenging to do and requires frankly, a high degree of expertise. So in this case, this patient did have quite a bit of B-lines, a very dilated IVC, uh, postal, elevated postility fraction, and these uh, discontinuous um, intra-renal venous flow. So this actually, this patient did have a severe amount of venous congestion, but you know, I'd say the patients we've done here um, with this technique, Usually there is a ton of problems it comes down to either patient habitus, like we can't see the portal vein properly or can't see the, the kidneys properly, or we can't even track uh, color Doppler in the kidneys, or they have poor cardiac windows. Like it's, yeah, the, the renal ultrasound technique is, is I think for sure the biggest issue uh, that I've had with this technique. And frankly, I, I do, I don't know, like, Graham, have you used this technique before? A couple of times, um, but I, I agree. I think that the number of cases where it's a, it's a clean spiritual image with a clean spiritual interpretation has been a, a small minority of the patients. That's the challenge. But it is patient helpful. Yeah, and I think, you know, in one of the questions that, because of course the problem is, is like what this predicts in the literature is it predicts renal failure. But like, is that is that really like what you're looking for? Like, uh, you know, the, if it predicts renal failure, if you change that, are you less likely to have renal failure? Are you are you decongesting them? Like, is it? It's unclear whether or not this technique really has has added value compared to what you would do normally. Yeah. I think that for me, this has been the surrogate for cardiorenal failure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in someone who has early signs of renal failure, yes, and they're not clearly intrarenal, pre-renal phase, and I see signs of congestion. Yeah, I treat that with cardiac and then attempt diuresis. Yeah, that makes and sense. I try to revisit the parameters, and I almost never have time, or they're never under my care for this to do this. But that's kind of been the case. I think that makes sense. You know, the, the kind of so-called cardiorenal syndrome is a, is a challenging one. Um, and often you're, you're kind of left scratching your head without much to do. So I think there definitely is uh, some, added, some added value there potentially. But yeah, the issue is oftentimes patients, if they're severely demitous, then your windows can be oh, yeah, uh, quite terrible. And patients we've had, we've wanted to do this on, have, have invariably ended up with terrible exams. <laughs> okay. 
So this is a bit of a, we didn't talk a lot about this topic this year, but I wanted to kind of just review this as a kind of a side note. So, you know, for a long time in critical care, there's been a large focus on ejection fraction. I think that's based largely from the cardiology literature um, that of course, this is the, the most important thing uh, that we rely on. It's certainly long-term, it carries a lot of prognostic value. It's not there isn't value in this. The problem is in our patients, there actually is an issue with using ejection fraction. So there's, it's influenced obviously if you have severe MR, I don't think that's the biggest concern because severe MR is uncommon enough, but LV geometry is important. For example, is it a big dilated heart, for example? So an EF of 30% in a massive heart can be a normal stroke volume. Um, and of course, a very small LV, okay? If you have a 70% ejection fraction of a very small cavity, you have a small stroke volume and can be influenced by loading conditions. So, you know, there are just some issues here with this technique um, because it may, it may kind of mislead you as to what the actual problem is. So a low EF does not necessarily mean a low stroke volume and a cardiac output, uh, especially with large end lock volume tachycardia. And when you have regional dysfunction, um, accuracy could also be impaired. And the problem is that, because of course, um, when you have regional dysfunction, and you were to do a, a formal measurement, diastole versus systole, the question is, is when do you measure in systole? Because of course the walls are not contracting at, at the same time. And so you're, you're, there will always be some challenge in measuring EF with regional dysfunction. And maybe all you wanna know is, is it depressed or is it not depressed, right? So I think there are some uh, ways around this. And I think the best way um, for intensivists and those who are gonna keep care to, to kind of grapple with um, stroke volume, cardiac function is using a special Doppler for cardiac output and stroke volume. Now, this looks complicated, but I think it's no more complicated than auscultating heart sounds, which I think is very, very complicated, um, but it's not easy. Uh, and so one of the issues is that if you're not familiar with uh, cardiac ultrasound and, and not uh, competent at maintaining views, this technique is hard, but principally, it makes sense. So I'm gonna go through that about what this technique is and what we use it for and what it does. So here, um, this is called the pulse wave Doppler. Okay, that those two vertical uh, horizontal lines there is the pulse wave gate that measures blood flow in that area. Okay, and what we're looking for is how much blood is going through the outflow tract or the stroke point. And those, that gate can be placed either within a centimeter of the valve or actually even at the valve. Okay, and what you want to do is have a measurement at the same site that you that you collect the pulse wave gate from, okay? Because you're trying to build this stroke volume in three in three D. Okay, we'll get to that. So we have the diameter of his air in systole, okay? We measure it. It's in systole because we want the stroke volume, which is in systole. So you take that measurement, cut it in half, make it a radius. Okay, and for those uh, who recall basic geometry, cross sectional area of a circle is pi r squared. Okay, so oftentimes we make the, we, we just even basically say that the, the diameter is probably two, so radius is one, r squared is one, and then basically cross-sectional area is equal to pi. Okay, but if you're being formal about it, you do wanna make this measurement, and you do want high quality uh, images. It's best to do this in zoom mode to make the measurement across the outflow tract. And then we use the uh, cross-sectional area here um, times your VTI. Now we'll, we'll go through that VTI essentially times your uh, cross-sectional area equals your stroke volume. The yeah, times your heart rate gives you cardiac output. But I realized I didn't actually talk extensively about the VTI part. So the VTI part is again, that pulse wave Doppler signal where you can see that those, that little green dotted line. Okay, that's a trace over the stroke volume area effectively. Okay, and it's a velocity time integral or VTI we can call it. And that gives you essentially a one dimensional stroke volume. Okay, so that's the blood flow in that region. You can see it's during systole, it's right after the onset of systole. And it's a nice uh, scout flow pattern where the inside's dark and the outside's bright. So that gives you again, almost like a one dimensional stroke volume. And what we're trying to do here with this is make that one dimensional stroke volume into a two-dimensional or three-dimensional plot, I'm sorry. That's why we take the diameter, we make this into a 3D space, 
and times that by VTI to equal stroke volume. So let's say the VTI is 20, okay, and the diameter of the tract is one, okay, then effectively, you know, we get our 20 times pi, we're at around 60 mils for stroke volume. Okay, so that's kind of where that comes up. And of course, times heart rate equals cardiac output, and then you can index that for body surface area. Now, how commonly we do this depends on your skill level, okay? But I would say that the, the easiest thing, okay, is just to do the VTI, okay? And rather than do, go through all the measurements, we can just do the VTI at the, at the uh, LVOT. And the VTI uh, has been shown in multiple studies now to, to correspond to kind of basic categories of stroke volume. Now, 17 to 23 in a normal heart rate predicts a fairly normal stroke volume. Okay, less than 17 predicts the lower stroke volume, greater than 22 predicts elevated stroke volume. But again, mostly uh, in, the, in the normal range, okay? If your heart rate's less than 60, then your VTI should be usually greater than 18 to be normal, okay? But this is, this is just some basics to consider because this means you don't have to necessarily do the actual uh, LVOT measurement. So again, a VTI 17 to 23 is normal.